Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. We are so glad to be back here with Serenity Book Club, and I am so happy and excited uh, for us to be together again this week. Last week, you all had a blast because you all had two fabulous uh, facilitators and a great panel uh, in Joan Douglas and Rose Cohen and all of the panelists, they just participated and it was amazing. And I'm so grateful. And I think that I'm going to allow those things to happen again and again and again, because we've got such great talent among us. I think Glenda will host us next time. How about that, Glenda? What do you think? <laughs> That's awesome. Well, listen, hey, so welcome everybody, those of you on Facebook. Thank you guys for being faithful uh, to joining us each and every week, Serenity Book Club. Uh, we are studying and reading a book called Forgiving What You Can't Forget. Discover How to Move On, Make Peace with Painful Memories, and Create a Life That's Beautiful Again by Lisa Turcos. And I wanted to say hello to Miss Vivian. Hi, Miss Vivian. How are you today? We are so glad that you are with us today. And all of those of you who are joining us on Facebook, we would love for you if you would do us a big favor and you would like this and love it and you would share it to your personal profiles so that we can make sure that this book and particularly this chapter, which is really powerful, this one is called Unchangeable Feels Unforgivable. I think that this one is really going to rock us and I know that we're not going to get through this chapter this week by itself because it is really truly needy. But before we get any further and without further ado, we definitely want to go to the Lord before him in prayer. And we have asked that teacher Bonnie, if she would go on and lead us in a word of prayer today, as we uh, just gather our thoughts and gather our lives together, because we need the spirit of God uh, desperately every day, but we need him in this discussion today so he can lead us and guide us. So I'm going to go on and throw that over to her. And thank you so much Dear Lord, we just thank you and praise you and we love you and we give you glory and honor, Father God, for your worthy. We thank you for this day. You uh, woke us up with our hearts and minds on you. And now, Father God, we're gathering together, Father, to help us to uh, go further in the book that we're reading, Father God. We just thank you for this book. We thank you for a light that you're shining on our lives and the lives of others, Father God, as we read this book. And Father, this particular section that we're reading, Unchangeable Feels Unforgivable. Father, we need your help. We need your help, Father God, because you forgave us we need to know how to forgive others, Father God. Even if the things happened in our lives a long time ago, Father God, we need your direction, your strength, your comfort, your uh, uh, wisdom in order to be a forgiving person, your child who forgives others, Lord. We thank you and we praise you, Father God, for this book. We thank you for Pastor Yvette and her selection of this particular book. And then we thank you, Father God, how you, Holy Spirit, are bringing things back to our remembrance, but also helping us and comforting us as we go through this book to um, draw closer to you and to um, uh, have a forgiving spirit. We just thank you and we praise you, Father God. We pray that um, we'll be able to share and encourage one another as we uh, discuss this particular chapter in the book, Lord God, and just be led by you, Father God, directed by you. We thank you. We praise you, Father God. We love you, Lord God. We know that we live and move and have our being because of you, Father God. And forgiveness is one of the things you want us to do, Lord God. So we want to be obedient to you. We thank you and we praise you, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for leading us today. We appreciate you more than you know. So thank you. And those of you who have joined us on Facebook, feel free to pop in and say hello to us so we can say hello back to you. Hello, Lawanda. We're glad that you're joining us today. We are continuing to pray for you and to lift you up as you serve so well each and every day, asking God to cover you in everything that you do. And those of you who come on in, just say hello, hello to us so that we can acknowledge you as we go through this discussion today. Uh, for those of you who don't know, we are reading this book called Forgiving, But You Can't Forget, Discovering How to Move On, Make Peace with Painful Memories, and Create a Life That's Beautiful Again by Lisa Turkos. She's an amazing writer, and she has been so authentic and honest, and we have loved this, and we appreciate it. Hello, Anastasia. We're glad that you're joining us today. Thank you for joining us. We love you. Hello, Pastor Les. Leslie, we are glad you're with us. Thank you for joining us today as well. So as we continue down this line, we wanted to make sure that we're looking at this chapter. And this was a difficult one uh, for many of us. Um, we were just talking about that before we went on air, uh, that this one called Unchangeable feels unforgivable. Now, um, a lot of the stuff that we've, we've heard and a lot of things we've talked about did not, uh, I think, hurt or um, scar as badly as this one did in my heart. And even though some of this did not happen to me, I just, my heart was just broke uh, for people who have uh, could identify with a lot of this stuff. So I hope that today, as we go through this, that you all will be blessed. And I hope that you'll be prayerful as we go through this discussion, because I think these are those honest conversations that we have to have together so that we can continue to grow in the word of God and in our relationship with one another and just dealing with ourselves and our own identity. So let's get at it. So she goes on and she starts in this chapter about talking about some photos that her mother had gathered in an attic for her. And uh, she began to see some things that were black and white. Uh, that was, uh, you know, black and white in her uh, room. And she began to see that in these black and white things, uh, she began to see a young woman that she just didn't really recognize. And I wonder sometimes when we go back through some of our pictures and we look at ourselves, you know, we know that those are the people that we are, but then we think about a lot of things of life. We reflect about those memories. Sometimes the memories are good. Sometimes the memories are bad. Uh, sometimes the memories are just what they are. And so then when you think deeply about these things. You think about some things that you could not change in life, things that just really did not feel all that great. And so she says here in uh, her pages, she says this photo that she had, the specific photo that had her with long brown hair and she was young and she was thin and she was saying that her body was very small and she was smiling. She wasn't really smiling, but she was lost in thought. And she says that this picture was taken during a season of being abused by her grandmother's neighbor. She says that he abused my body, but he also tried to destroy my mind and soul. He'd taken scriptures and justified things so dark, no little girl should ever, ever have to endure them. He convinced me that I had, was a very, very awful child and I believed him, so I despised myself. What he stole from me then wasn't just the innocence of a beautiful imagination of childhood simplicity. He yanked me into a pit of fear. I still have to fight to stay out of it this day. I fear that I am not worth being loved. Fear that other people will use me and then toss me aside. Fear 
the worst case scenarios will always happen to me. I knew that it wasn't happening to my other friends. So why was it happening to me? She further goes on and says that the freedom to be a playful child got stolen. I learned to think like an adult, to try and save myself. By the time the abuse stopped, the carefree girl I once was had been replaced by a cautious girl. And though I experienced lots of counseling and healing, I still find myself assuming the absolute worst might very well happen to me. And I'm constantly bracing for the impact. Now, this might not be your story. You may not identify with this at all, but I know that there might be some things that are in our lives that you could identify in this story. And so I wanna ask you, um, and a question that she begins to ask a little bit further as she explains about the different perspectives of forgiveness, she uh, she returns back to this gray table that she talks about in chapter one and chapter two and chapter three. And she feels that sometimes the unchangeable changes her perspective, her perspective and how unreasonable it is. And it's hard to have hopeful perspective, she said, around permanent outcomes that you absolutely didn't want. So before we go any further, has anyone ever identified with something that's happened in your life? Um, Some level of forgiveness that you have had to address, that you have felt that this permanent situation that happened to you, could have been as a child, it could have been as a teen, it could have been as an adult, that this permanent situation, this outcome that you didn't want uh, this this forgiveness that seems almost impossible has affected all of the season of your life. And those of you on Facebook, we would love for you to start weighing in on this as the panel begins to talk about this as well. Because what we have to do is we have to get to the point where we can be honest in discussion so that we can help one another in these times. So, Pass it, pass it back. Yes. Pass it back. I'll start. Uh -huh. Could you turn uh, your volume down just a little bit so we can hear you right? Okay. Can okay. you hear me now? Perfect. I, I can relate to a lot that she said and that she shared. And it brought up feelings of that 11-year-old um, girl in me that believed those lies that I wasn't able to be loved or lovable. And um, even I'm uh, in November, I'll be 68. So I still have those feelings. Uh, and even um, reading this book and this chapter, I would stuff my feelings down with food. I was really trying to say, I can't, I'm not going to eat about it. I'm not going to eat about it. Lord, help me, help me. <laughs> but yes, I can relate to this. And even some things thinking that I, I wish had turned out different. And I and I go I stay in that woulda coulda mindset. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing so authentically. It's it's difficult, I'm sure, to, to share about this. Anyone else? When you think about that, have, have you thought about those hard things? It, it it could have happened at any time. It doesn't have to be abuse. It's just something that has hurt you in your life and it's a permanent thing and, and you kind of lost your perspective because it was something that you absolutely didn't want to happen. Anyone? Hey, hey Pastor, this is Rose. Um, I had, when I read that part with the, um, with the photo, I had the exact same uh, experience yeah. with looking at a photo of myself from childhood and I was looking at it and I was like, I really don't even know that little girl. I saw the picture. I could see that it was in uh, in the place that I grew up in. And I could see that, you know, she had my face, but I didn't recognize her. I didn't remember the moment of taking the picture. And it was at the time that I was old enough to have to 
to be able to remember the picture. And so it definitely caused me to start questioning, like what in the world, you know, why can't I remember my, myself? And so as I'm looking at the photo, I start to re realize that, oh, this is about the age that um, trouble started coming into my life. And, um, and I, I had started blocking things out. And, uh, and it's something that the author said that while she was um, <clears throat> looking at her photo, that she, that's when she began learning how to hide inside of herself. And I was like, that's that, that's definitely when I when she said those words, I know exactly what she means because as a result of the trauma, you will um you can uh learn different ways to protect yourself that become they at first they're protection and then they become habit and then they're just a part of what you do and you don't really get the opportunity to even check yourself because it's just part, you know, it's a reflex. As the same as if you cough, if something's choking you, um, you respond in these negative ways, like, uh, you know, in fearful ways. So, yeah, I definitely understand where she's coming from on this part. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah. I think that, you know, regardless of whether or not it happens in childhood or whether or not it happens at a later time, there are some things that have a permanent mark. And those of you from Facebook, feel free to share as well as the panel. Uh, did anyone else want to share on this area? I thought it was interesting. She began to say that um, other people assume bad things will never happen to them, while I do the opposite. Have you ever met somebody that is really just, they just think gloom and doom all the time, and you wonder it in your mind, why is this person always so negative? Why do they think that nothing will ever happen for them. Have you ever thought about that it might be some trauma that, that has happened to them, something that has caused them over time that they just don't trust that anything ever good is going to happen to them? Anyone? And those of you on Facebook, feel free to share uh, as well. Well, you know, I mentioned... Uh, yeah. Teacher Bonnie? Go ahead, Bonnie. I, I mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago about a friend who I've uh, gotten back in contact with her. And, and, and that was what kind of ran me away from her because she does have that spirit of mm -hmm. um, nothing good is going to happen for me. She, I can remember her telling me about the expectations that her parents had for her. And then things that happened in her life that they would have never been able to receive. And because her parents would have never been able to receive those things, she, you know, she lived in her own, you know, I, I can't share that with, I can't talk to my mother. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And it was such a negative thing for me. I kind of pulled away from her. But now that I have God in my life and I can, you know, help hopefully i can help her see him because she she doesn't see him but yeah I, I i've got a friend like that and, and mm -hmm. um and i still she is my friend she's my friend we just weren't in contact with one another for a while okay. but yes her negative 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 anyone else before we move a little further I'm not going to say that if I know somebody or if that somebody could possibly be me, I, I'm okay. not going to reveal that information. And just but, you're, talking uh, for, you're talking for a neighbor or a friend. Yeah, just, I mean, it's possible that that person um, does that out of defense because um, there's been so much disappointment that if you let yourself get excited or if you let your guard down and get too close to anything, that you really want to keep around, then you um, inevitably you feel like you're going to get yourself hurt again. So you start from the beginning with gloom and doom. That person is terrible. I hope she, I hope that that person gets over that. Yeah, I understand. Anastasia says 
Yes, I always tell people to consider a person's childhood when they're difficult or have certain personality traits. You know, that's very insightful for you, Anastasia, because a lot of people don't do that. Uh, they automatically assume things, and especially, unfortunately, in the body of Christ, mm -hmm. we, uh, we have a tendency to be so impatient with one another when it comes to hurts and pains and what have you. And then we want to over-spiritualize as she is, uh, as the psychiatrist had talked about that with her uh, earlier in the book, where we hyper-spiritualize things and make people confess things that they don't really feel. Uh, and so then we never get to the root of anything that's going on. So thank you for that wise insight that God has given to you, Anastasia, and thank you for sharing. And those of you on Facebook, always feel free. If you hear something, just jump right in and uh, put it in the chat. And we're happy to be able to share that because we want to hear from you. Uh, that's how a, a book club is. It's a discussion of us all. And so we appreciate your being here. Um, that's before we move on? That's I want yeah. to agree with Anastasia. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, you got to look at people in their past because you don't know. But also, we have a tendency to look at people, family. Mm -hmm. You don't know the difference in that one person in their family that they went through. The whole family might seem like perfect and everything going well, but you don't know the struggle that one person went through. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. when parents have, especially when parents have more than one kid, when they have a whole host of kids, somebody in that group get lost. Things not the same for them. So we have to even take that into consideration and not look at you, for example, you and Thomas, we might look at you and you had a beautiful life with yours and Thomas might have struggled some, but we can't say, well, Yvette is fine. So why is Thomas like that? So we have to do it the same way. Because I know as we look at people, family, and, and we have said, well, that family, but you don't know what that one or two person went with. Everybody's life in that family is not the same. So I agree with her with the childhood and the way of growing up. And like 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 Miss Rose, Professor Rose, I'm not saying whether it was me or my neighbor <laughs> or a friend <laughs> down the street, but I could assure you <laughs> that it's not the same for everybody. People get different treatment, di different everything within the family. And, and thank you for mentioning that um, I'm the perfect child and my brother was not. Thank <laughs> you. I that. Thomas, Thomas, I did not say that. Yes, Thomas, I did not say that. Today. So thank you. <laughs> I know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. So let's move on. So one of the things that, oh, okay. So let's see what's happening here. So I have uh, anesthesia. She said, I was just like someone that, uh, that, you know, Rose, she said, I was afraid to let anyone close to me because I experienced so much hurt from people. And I still do. Yeah. Those things are long lasting, even though we have the love of Christ and the, the scripture says that if anybody is in Christ, we are a new creation. Uh, the old things are passed away and behold, all things have become new. That has to do with the regeneration, but it doesn't have to do with our memories and it doesn't have to do with our history and trauma. It has to do with the fact that our, our forgiveness, <laughs> it, you know, all that stuff that kept us from relationship with Christ is, is passed away. And so now we have to start working through so that that sanctification comes in and that uh, redemptive parts of us come in so that we can receive from Christ what he needs to do in our lives. And that forgiveness issue is a real big key of that. I thought it was interesting. She talks about some of the effects of her childhood and that because of what she had gone through, the abuses, the constant changes, the loss of her sister, uh, you know, the, the situation with her father and his leaving and all of those things that impacted her life, that she always imagined uh, almost the worst growing up. She imagined that eventually she was going to go to trial and go to jail 
you know, for a thousand different accidents that, you know, that she was going to be involved in. She always thought about uh, the funerals of loved ones that she was going to have to plan because they got home late or didn't answer their phones or when she repeatedly called them, she fretted. She said uh, about everyone and everything uh, that she got so literally uh, unable to eat sometimes because she was always in a constant panic and a constant worry. And hello, Cynthia. Thank you for joining us today. We are glad to see you here today as well. One of the things that she uh, talks about, and I thought that this was a really good thing for us to look at, she goes on and says that hard unfair things happen to us all. Maybe on some level, we're all constantly bracing for impact. We just express it in different ways. So while I'm looking for you on Facebook to start uh, just commenting on that, what did you guys hear in the panel think about that statement? Hard, unfair things happen to us all, maybe on some level. We're all constantly bracing for impact. We just express it in different ways. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Is there some truth to that? A little bit of truth? No truth? Let's, let's talk about it. It is true for me. Bye, Luanda. And... We love you. Enjoy. Thank you for taking care of us. Bye, Lamanda. So, Pastor, it's true for me, um, but it is something that I'm currently trying to actively work on and trying to correct. Um, like I was saying before, it just becomes like uh, it's, it's second nature, becomes your instinct. And so I'm trying, and whenever I'm aware of it, and I've notified and, you know, asked my friends to let me know when I'm showing signs of, uh, of just trying to, you know, self-protect in ways that I shouldn't uh, need to. So it's definitely a part of me and I'm trying to break that instinct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Cynthia says that she agrees with that statement. Thank you for sharing, uh, Cynthia. Anyone else? Do you all um, agree, disagree, uh, anything? Pastor Yvette, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree. I, and I don't handle things like I should, but I'm working on it after reading this. Okay. Okay. Thank you for sharing. Did you want to share, Aprella? You have to unmute yourself and turn down your mic a little bit, your volume. I agree. I agree. You agree? Okay. 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 I agree, yeah, yeah. I agree also. Okay. And, and we do when once we get to that point, we just we have to embrace ourselves waiting for the next shoe to fall. It just uh when it seemed to have happened so often in your life that it always comes your way, you're always waiting for it. As the old people always said, for that next shoe to drop, to what else is going to happen? What else is going to come my way? And, and you're looking at everybody else because they handle it different. Not that they don't have some of the same thing going on. That you think that they don't have that in their life. But the difference is that for me, is that I need to learn how to stop expecting the worst. Stop expecting and waiting for the other shoe to fall. Stop uh, wondering about, well, why are all her ways going? It's not, I, I have come to find out lately that it's not, that so many people have gone through so many things. It's just a difference in the way that we handle it. So I need to just somehow refocus myself and, and replant myself and start watering myself again so I could grow into that person who could accept whatever's coming their way with the love of God, to have Jesus just walk me through it, have him, you know, kind of build me up. But 
I really believe that we have a hard time with it because of the way that we handle it. I know my aunt called yesterday and we talked for a long time and we was talking about various things. And it's, it's not that some of the things haven't happened to her and uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. it's definitely that I handle things different. So yeah. I have to learn to handle things better now and, and really truly work on in this book, it's just opening so many doors as I was talking to her and telling Definitely. her. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, wow, Lord, where's this coming from? I had never in my life, it's just gonna be the first time I'm here too, and I don't care who hears it. I have ever told anybody that I was treated so bad when my first when my son was born. But God wanted him here. He's a pastor now. Mm -hmm. I never told anybody that I was raped to have, and that's how I got impregnated. I never told anybody because I was treated so bad, like I was the outcast of the world at that time. Wow. So I let that really just hit me. I wouldn't take pictures. I wouldn't do anything. I, I just didn't think that I should be here in the world with people because I was made to feel so bad about the fact that I had this child. And I didn't have it because that was what I was doing or who I was, but that's who they thought I was and made me become. Oh. Uh, or tried to make me become. I didn't become that. <laughs> or tried to make me, you know, become. So when we talked, it was really deep. And, I, and I, I started realizing as I was reading and I was hearing, I was listening to her. That's why a lot of these things have really made me into who I, who I was. It was hurtful things. So I have spoken. And <laughs> Oh, wow. Thank you so much for being so vulnerable. That was uh, something very deep to share. And I'm sure that someone is going to really be helped and blessed because of that testimony, because we see you now and who you are now. Uh, wow. Wow. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing. Anastasia says, she says, I get carried away with doom and gloom thoughts. And when I realize it, I allow the Holy Spirit to calm my mind. It's so instantaneous to go there. And I think we can quickly find ourselves going there uh, when we've had trauma like that and unimaginable trauma. You know, sometimes we sit in church with one another. Sometimes we uh, go to Sunday school with one another and we never know each other's stories and we never know what we've been through and what we're fighting through. And it is just amazing uh, that our God loves us so sovereignly and that he takes care of us in the midst of all of these things that have been happening to us through our lives. Anyone want else want to share before we move on? Because she starts talking about this unchangeable that can absolutely feel unforgivable. But I don't want to move to that until I've had a chance for everyone to share. And those of you on Facebook, I always want to remind you, we are attentive to your responses. So feel free to put things in the chat all the time. We will definitely address it. Anyone else want to share before we move on a little bit more? Okay. She says here, every bit of it still makes me cry sometimes. It's so dang unfair. Even worse, it's also dang unchangeable. And unchangeable can feel, absolutely feel unforgivable. She says, I grieve over it all, grieving is dreaming in reverse. What did you all think about that? And she goes on and says this again. She says that when you are grieving over something or someone that has taken away, you wish you could go back in time. You dream in reverse. Anybody? Pastor Yvette, I could say that I, I do that. I always wish I could go back and be that, handle that situation different or, or just 
you know, not let it go on so long or, or whatever it is. I, I just, and sometimes I stay there and that's not good, you know. So I'm learning in all things, give thanks to God. I know that you all have been saved so long, you probably don't know anything about the secular world or the secular music world, but there used to be a song long time ago, I wish I could just turn back the hands of time. See, none of y'all know about that because you all are saved. Y'all been saved for a really long time. Y'all don't know about that. And those of you in Facebook, I'm so sorry. You all have been saved so long. You don't know nothing about that. I, I get it. I really do. So uh, forgive me for my uh, carnality. I just went there. But there was a song that was recorded and the lyrics say, said, if I could only turn back the hands of time. That's sometimes that we reverse things in our minds and we think in our grief that if I could redo things, it's almost like uh, if you ever see in the Marvel universe when they actually teleport to another area, or if you ever see in Star Trek where they go back in a warp area and then they try to reorder, you know, Earth, and they always say that you're never supposed to try to redo those things, but everybody tries to do it. So if I could redo it, this would have never happened this way. I would have never gone out with that person. I would have never spent time with them. I would have bought property. I would have done this. I would have done that if I could only secularly turn back the hands of time. Anybody want to uh, just jump in? And those of you on Facebook, feel free to jump in. I think we did get a comment from Facebook. Here we go. Uh, she says, yes, Cynthia says, yes, I dream in reverse. Absolutely. It bothers me sometimes when I feel I have not handled a situation well. I often want to go back and talk to the people that have gone on. It's overwhelming sometimes. Cynthia, I absolutely agree with you. I've had those discussions with people. I know they can't hear me and I've had those discussions again and again. And yeah. It's 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 uh, sometimes mind blowing. Anyone else? I'll Jay? just say I wish. Okay. I really do wish. You really wish? Okay, Rose. Okay. Were you going to say something, Joan? I'm sorry. I thought you unmuted. I get, okay. My my connection is very slow today, but uh, yes, I dream in reverse. Um, just. This whole chapter, I just got to say, this whole chapter just hit my pit of my stomach because my heart went out to Lisa and her experiences. And um, I think back in dreaming in reverse when I had my children all so young and they were all together. And then I was going, if I just would have went to that event, you know, I wouldn't be pregnant again. Or if I... <laughs> would have done such and such, you know, I wouldn't have three start, you know, three steps of children. But now, as I think about it now, it's a blessing, you know, of me going through that and experiencing that of having my children all together. But um, yes, I do dream in reverse sometimes, most definitely. And you guys have been doing an excellent job. I love your conversation and what you guys have been saying thus far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so that that's good. Thank you guys for sharing. Uh, anyone else want to share? Because this grieving in reverse is really deep. Yeah, I just want to say I, I do also. And to Jones, remember, God don't make no mistake. Even though we think mm -hmm. it might be a mistake, he knew those three children and what they would do and grow up. So yeah. We want to go back and redo things, but God have an intention for everything that he that happened. Even when I got raped, he knew that he had a plan for my child. I didn't know, mm -hmm. but he knew at that moment that this child was supposed to be here. And he's supposed to be doing exactly what he's doing now with all these young men and young ladies that he mentored and he coached and he preached with. So without him, we don't even know, you know where they would be or what, what would have happened. So, but I, I do dream in the reverse. And unfortunately, sometimes I do dream where it wouldn't have happened. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I would not have had them, but I'm so thankful to God for him. 
Yeah. So it's not just that we look ahead, like she says, you know, sometimes you dream of what you wanted to be in the future, but sometimes when you're dreaming in reverse, you're like, you know, what if I had gone to medical school? What if I had gone to uh, law school? Maybe, maybe if I had done this, maybe things would be different. Maybe if I had done that, maybe if I'd be different, you know, maybe I should have, uh, you know, said no. Uh, to this opportunity, and I could have been here, or, um, you know, my constant dream, what if I had just stowed away on the ship and gone to Ocho's Rios, wouldn't my ministry be blowing up there right now? You know, we're always dreaming in reverse, right? We're doing those things, you know, we think about all those things as to what it could have been and those things that help us to uh, reflect and those hopings, that feeling, the impossible, those things that are unchangeable in that sense, because we can't change what happened when you were a kid. You can't change what happened when you were a teen. You can't have change what happened when you were a young adult or even a middle adult or you know as you were growing older. But what we can know is that even when this unchangeable can feel unforgivable, even when we are dreaming in reverse, we feel like these healing is still possible. Because even if we start feeling that it's impossible, these circumstances feel unchangeable. But one of the things that she talks about here is these things that might resonate with us. Do you all remember reading that when she was talking about how uh, she's asking us the question, are these things that resonate with us? Did you all remember reading that? Anybody? She says, um, she says instead of hoping of what day, uh, you long for a more innocent time. You are un, you are lived more unaware tragically. The griever knows that they can't go back in time. So fe healing feels impossible because circumstances feel unchangeable. And see if any of these unchangeable situations resonate with you. So when you looked at that list of un uh, things, anything resonated with you guys? I'll give you a for instance, and those of you on Facebook, if this resonates with you, just, just jump on in. When someone takes something, I will never get it back. When someone takes something, I will never get it back. Anybody that resonate with anybody? It may not. Anybody? Anybody want to admit it for your neighbor, <laughs> for your friend? <laughs> I'm going to admit it for myself, Pastor, because it is um, like, I think, okay, so I'm going to go deep with y'all. So I'm in therapy, right, for some things that, you know, I'm just trying to live life better. And my therapist always says, you don't have enough anger about the things that, uh, you know, that you live through. And um and I agree with her. I don't have the the anger. I just have a lot of grief over the things that I lost and the way that it made me different. And, um, you know, so I, I grieve over things, but I don't have the anger. So, yeah, I want my stuff back. <laughs> I want it all back. Oh, that's a Ty Tribbett song, too. So, yeah, I want it all back. I think it's a... Um... Who else recorded it? It was one of the Clark sisters. Uh, Cynthia said that it depends upon the person, uh, you know, and, and so I get that too, Cynthia, I do. One of the other things that she talks about that might resonate with you, she says, when I have to face not just the end of this relationship, but the end of all the dreams and future plans that were attached to that person. Anybody identify, anybody resonate with that when you had to face the end of the relationship, not just the end of the relationship, but all the dreams and all the future plans that were attached to this person. Um, 
I know for uh, those of us who've been divorced or those of us who have had uh, longer relationships or uh, you've been engaged or what have you, and you had dreams of what a life would have been with this person, um, but you had those future plans, all those things that are attachment. It's not just the relationship that ends, but everything that was planned in the future. Anybody else that can that resonate it with? That's the event. I, I can resonate. I guess mine goes one and two goes together because uh, all those years that I allowed myself to to have this person take from me, you know, it was sort of like a mind control. I, I regret that and I'll never get that back. I mean, I, I can learn from it and I can... Uh, counsel somebody or or encourage them not to go that way but i can never get that person back and then even the dream that i had being married and our marriage was going to be like this and that and then the marriage ends in divorce and none of that all my dreams and the future plans i had disappeared mm -hmm. yeah so that can resonate with you. And those of you on Facebook, feel free to chime in on any of these. One of the other things she says is when the hurt is so great to me that the one who hurts me acts like it's no big deal. Anybody that resonate with? Reverend Yvette, I got a question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like uh, when someone takes something, I will never get back. Does that include money? Yeah, it could. You know, I guess maybe they didn't take well. You loaned them the money on the stipulation they're going to repay it. Mm -hmm. But they avoid you. So in, in essence, they don't, they really had no intention in repaying you. So would that be the same? <laughs> it could be It could be a hurting thing. It could be a hurting thing. That's why. Well, yeah, uh, it's, yeah, it's a hurting thing, especially, you know, when if you loan somebody money, like bill money. You know, maybe it's a mortgage or some uh, some other kind of uh, utility bill. And you loan this and they tell you, well, I'm going to give this back to you on thus and so day. And I, you say, yeah, yeah, because I need it because this is my my mortgage payment or water bill payment or school payment, tuition, you know, that I owe. And they don't come through. You know, that's important. Yeah. And that's a reason why we have to deal with the forgiveness issue with that. You're right. Anastasia says that she really does because she was married to a pastor and she said it was a horrible experience. And she always fantasized on how it should have been. Yeah, Anastasia, I get it. Along with Glenda, who just was talking about disappointment that happens when you depend upon someone to when in covenant to come back with their word. It, whether or not it's covenant in a marriage, whether it is covenant by saying, I promise that on such and such a date, I'm going to repay. If it's covenant in terms of I'm going to be there for you and you're not there, there can be all kinds of things. Cynthia says, yes, but thank God for the Holy Ghost who showed me what I needed to see at the perfect time. Amen. Amen. Sometimes God can uh, some stop some stuff right in the middle of it that we were going to get into the middle of foolishness. I, I want to put one more up and then we're going to have to close and we'll have to come back to these things that resonate. When the pain seems never ending. Anybody ever experienced that? I know when I wear uh, those really good high heel shoes, because I don't wear high heel shoes really well. It feels like the pain is never ending. Anybody ever feel that way? Where you just feel like if I just walk one more minute, I'm just my whole body is going to uh, just resonate with pain. And that's kind of what we feel when we're disappointed and hurt by people. Like a bad shoe 
that you're walking in that you've been in too long and you knew you should have brought some gym shoes along, but you were too stupid because you wanted to be cute. And now your feet are hurting, your whole body's hurting and everything's resonating in and then the nerves are getting to you. And now everything's aching from the top down. That's how bad the pain that can happen when you've dealt with trauma. And, 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 and people uh, who, you know, uh, are, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to parse my words, um, people of various persuasions that uh, tend to get on your nerves. Yes, there you go. I think that was appropriate. Anyone can identify, anybody resonate? And those of you on Facebook, have you had that never ending pain? Feels like that that really tight shoe. I think that's really why uh, Cinderella actually slipped out of her shoe. I don't think she left it for uh, Prince Charming. <laughs> I think that 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 big old glass slipper and her foot started swelling at the ball as she took that thing off and ran down those stairs. But I digress. <laughs> anyone? Anyone? Everybody feel that pain? Uh, yeah, it definitely feels like the pain is never going to end. But um, I think the important thing as believers, or for me as a believer, is to always remember that God is, he was with me. He is with me. He's always going to be with me. So when things are are too hard. He has a way of uh, protecting me and shielding me from too much pain. And he has a way of giving me hope to know that at some day, at some point there will be healing from this. I'll be able to be set free. So, okay. but yeah, uh, in my natural mind, it does feel like it could be ever, everlasting. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you. I, I was trying to be PC. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Well, listen, guys, if you, oh, oh, Miss Vivian, oh, we have to hear from you. She says, when people close to you hurt and disappoint you, you tend to distance yourself from relationship with others. It is true. You, uh, There's isolation that comes with that. I think so. So wise, Miss Vivian. We have to learn mm -hmm. to understand ourselves and to understand others. And that's why we're reading this book together. It's been so good. And this one has been hard. I hope that those of you who are um, been listening, that you all have gotten this book. Uh, this book is called Forgiving uh, That Which You Can't Forget. This is a book by Lisa Turcos, and she has been amazing to share with us about this wonderful uh, thing how we can learn how to move on, you know, in our lives and, and make peace, not only with God and ourselves, but with others, with these painful memories, and then to be able to see life more beautiful again. I pray that today that you are encouraged, uh, that this discussion in very vulnerable ways uh, has been a help to you to let you know that you're not by yourself. But there are other people who've been through some stuff that you've been through. Um, and, and some of you all have not been molested. Some of you have not been raped. Some of you all have not been hurt by disappointment or divorce or, or separation or even death. Uh, but some of you have. And, and, and some of you all are dreaming in reverse and, and, and going back and, and regretting things that you should have said or could have said or what have you. And you haven't forgiven yourself yet. And sometimes forgiveness is even forgiving yourself. And so I pray that today uh, that you will find the joy of God and that you would forgive yourself as we continue to go through this book. I thank you for joining us. I thank you those who are on Facebook and those of you who will see this later on YouTube, that you will be blessed and that you'll be encouraged. I thank you, uh, women of God, for joining us on the panel today. All of those of you who are on Facebook and all of your comments, it's been amazing. And as we continue to grow in this, we will ask the Lord to help us to dissect the unchangeable that feels unforgivable 
so that we can feel forgiven and changed by God who can do greater things than we can imagine. So if you can, will you join us next week? Will you join us next week and, and get this book? We're in chapter eight, I still, and we've got a lot more to talk about. And I promise you, you will be glad. So have a great day. And uh, we'll see you next week. But the Lord says the same. He is still gracious and still wonderful. God bless you guys. And um, we'll see you uh, next week. Goodbye now.